In today's episode of the podcast, I'll be sharing with you my newly finished Little Black Tea, as well as sharing some eye-opening realizations I've recently had regarding two of my works in progress. So if that sounds like just your cup of tea, get cozy and let's dive in. Hello, 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 and welcome to the Wool Needles Hands Knitting Podcast. My name is Taylor, and I will be your host. I am so happy to be here with you guys today. I have a lot to share with you, including a finished object and some really interesting thoughts that I have on a couple of sweaters that I'm knitting. But before we get into any of that, I have an important and exciting announcement that I want to share with you first. The work that I do here to create the Wool Needles Hands YouTube channel and to provide high quality knitting content twice every week has quickly become a passion project of mine. I absolutely love putting out videos, producing the content for you guys. I love the work that goes into it. I love the interactions between us and I love the community that's been fostered in this space. However, in order for me to continue producing videos at the rate that I'm producing them now and to maintain quality and always seek to improve that quality, I have some things that I need to take into consideration. Number one, there is a lot of time and energy and expense that goes into producing high quality videos content for YouTube and I love taking the time to do that. However, in addition to operating Fiber for the People, my hand dyed yarn business, producing consistent content here at Wool Needles Hands is becoming a full-time job. A job I am very, very happy and feeling very fortunate to have and one that I wanna keep for the long haul. But like any job, it needs to pay the bills and I need to be considering the time that I'm putting into this, the expenses I'm putting into this, and my family. And so it is time that I share with you that I will be launching the official Wool Needles Hands Patreon group on Friday, September 22nd. And I am so excited for this. I want to provide an opportunity for those people who are tried and true fans of the Wool Needles Hands YouTube channel to become part of something even more than what's already here. I am in no way changing the current upload schedule for the Wool Needles Hands YouTube channel. Everything that you see here on YouTube is going to stay the same. It will be free, it will be twice a week, a midweek ramble, and a knitting podcast as usual. But the Patreon will be something a little extra for those of you that would like to become members and help to support me even further. Now, Patreon is going to be one way that you can help to support the Wool Needles Hands YouTube channel and the work that I'm doing here. And it's a big way and it makes a big difference. However, if a subscription's not for you, there are other ways that you can help support the work that I'm doing here to keep the lights on for the long haul. That could be purchasing merch from the Wool Needles Hands merch shop, which is always linked down below, or even dropping a super thanks, which you can find below the video. It's a one-time monetary donation to the channel. There's no commitments and it can be as little as $1.99 just to let me know that you're thankful for the work that I'm putting out here and that you're finding value in the content that I provide. It is going to help allow me to produce videos and content here at the channel, like I always say, for the long haul. And that is exactly what I want to do because I love this space, I love this community, and I love bringing all of this content to you. But in the meantime, let's go ahead and dive in to what I have to share with you guys for today podcast episode. The first thing I want to share with you guys today is the little black elephant in the room that I'm wearing right now. This is the little black t-shirt that I've been working on for a really long time. And considering the size of this little number, like a, a really long time, I had been dragging my heels on this and I'm so happy to have it finished. I know it's going to be difficult for you to see all of the details, so I'm going to show a couple of pictures so you can see what the raglan seam looks like, and then I'm going to stand up here and hopefully you can get a little bit of an idea of what's going on. But this is just an improvised, fully improvised, I am not following a pattern here. I sort of improvised this pattern, throwing it together from notes and things that I've taken from other designs that I've knit in the past. So this is really just kind of me playing around, if you will. So I'm sorry to say I can't direct you to a particular pattern. However, I will direct you to, a, and I can't remember, I don't actually remember what the name of the pattern is, but Petite Knit has a t-shirt pattern um, that is very similar to this, that if you wanted it to look like what I'm wearing now, you could modify it to look like this with like cap sleeves. Yeah, the poppy tee. Okay, so the poppy tee is a t-shirt by Petite Knit, very similar. Well, hold on, it's not a raglan seam. 
Okay, so it's not a raglan seam sweater, but it's a very similar sweater and a similar kind of aesthetic, if you will. So if you want something similar, you want to follow a pattern, this would be a good one to follow. Um, yeah, it's, it's a cute, it's a really cute top. But what I have here is uh, no pattern, just fully improvised. And I highly recommend you try that. If you have had some experience knitting a top-down sweater, um, I would really consider trying improvising your own top-down garment, just so that you can kind of become comfortable with taking your own measurements and creating the size based on your own personal measurements. I always direct folks to the Karen Templer um, How to Improvise a Top-Down Sweater blog series that she has. It's fantastic. It's a great way to have like kind of have your hand held as you walk through the process and that would get you started with something like this. But this is otherwise fully improvised. I had plans on making the sleeves a little longer here, but once I tried it on, after I had finished the body and I got it to the length that I wanted, once I tried this on, and we're dealing with clouds and the sun and clouds today, so just bear with me. But once I tried it on, I really liked the capped sleeves. I did add a little bit of length after I stuck the needle back in there to start knitting my sleeves. I added just a little tiny bit of length and then I bound off and have them just rolling. So there's no um, ribbing on the sleeves. They're just little rolled cap sleeves and I love them. And then the hem, I don't even know, you're not gonna be able to see this. I'm gonna stand up so you can kind of see how things look. Okay, so we have my jeans come up to about yeah, like that's my belly button right here. Oh, I have an idea. Let's do some acrobatics. Da, 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 da. Okay. Let's keep it together. There we are. There. Okay, so you can kind of see where it hits at my jeans. I'm wearing a like camisole tank top underneath, so when I lift my arms, it's not like exposing my skin, but it's really comfortable. And I really love the detail. I don't know if you can even if the sun decided to come back out, that, that would be great. Um, but yeah, so that's what the, the bottom looks like. <sighs> Jeez, it's dangerous. Let's move my chair back. Okay. Yeah, okay. So yeah, it, it's just a little black t-shirt with really cute raglan seams going down the raglans here. It's just, it's lovely. I'm gonna pop in a picture of the t-shirt folded. I, I love it though. I really, really love it. I'm tempted to put something else on so that I can hold it up and show you. Just a second. I keep this like, this is my Felix crop. Um, this is a really heavily modified version of the Felix pullover by Amy Christopher's. Um, also capped sleeve, so that's what I'm going to wear right here. Uh, to take the place of my black tee to see if I can't show you a little bit more here. Okay, so here it is. I'm like trying to look to see if you can... Yeah, you can kind of see what the raglan seams are doing in there. You see how pretty that is? I really love it. And then the hemline along the bottom looks like that. There's a little ridge of pearl bumps right before the ribbing, but the sleeves are just a rolled sleeve. That's them right here. So it's just a very simple little crop. Not, it's kind of cropped. I mean, look, it's obviously kind of cropped, right? And I love it. I really am so happy with it. I knit this using a merino cotton yarn by um, Gracious. Hold the phone. So this is about strings. It's a yarn that you can pick up on Amazon. It's, I wanna say 65%, no, 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 55% extra fine merino and 45% cotton. It's a gorgeous yarn because it's black. You're really not going to be able to see the details, but it's a beautiful yarn. I would say it's an all season yarn. It's got enough merino in there to keep it warm, but it's got that nice cotton in there to keep it from being too toasty. I love the texture. I love the stitch definition, but I will tell you that the stitch definition can kind of bite you in the butt when it comes to weaving your ends in at the end because everything kind of shows through the fabric. So I don't know if you can see, well, I don't know, you might not be able to notice, but where you weave in your ends, if you're not really careful, you notice little areas of kind of like texture on the fabric overall. 
but it's not too bad. It's it's really not all that noticeable. And I uh, weaved in my ends after I blocked it. So I bet you if I blocked it again, they would kind of block out. But it's really very beautiful. It's such a nice, just easy wearing little cropped t-shirt. And I absolutely love it. And it just looks like a giant black hole on the screen. What are you going to do about that? Okay, I'm going to go ahead and put this back on because we're, you know, I, I want to wear my finished piece. So just one second. Okay, and we're back. Now I'm sure that things are going to be sticking to it. Yeah, fuzzies, all kinds of who knows what. Okay, so that is my little black t-shirt and it's finished. And I'm really happy to have it finished because I plan on wearing this. I actually plan on wearing this tomorrow when I go volunteer at my son's school. I'll be proud to wear a hand knit item and it's just, it's great. And I can wear this with cardigans, which is kind of nice. So when the weather cools down, the sleeves are, you know, the way that they're capped right here, I can wear it with my more um, oversized cardigans and it'll look super cute. Knits on knits on knits. So I love it, I love it. Improvised little black tee and I couldn't be happier. Okay, I wanna share with you a little bit about these other two sweaters that I happen to be working on. I am working on sweater number 18 by My Favorite Things Knitwear, and I'm also working on the Stripe Hype Pullover by Veronica Lindbergh. And I wanna start, and I'm, I'm so I'm kinda gonna just be talking about both of these together. I, I have made some progress. However, I made a considerable amount of progress, but then I had kind of an awakening if you will. So these are two sweaters that are knit contiguously. So what that means is that you begin by knitting the back of the sweater. And as you knit the back, you're creating shoulder shaping. After that's finished, you pick up stitches along each of the shoulders, you knit each of the shoulders, and then you connect it to knit the front of the sweater. You knit the full front of the sweater and when that's done, you connect the front and the back and then you begin knitting in the round. It's the same for this sweater and it is the same for this sweater, which is my really kind of lumpy, bumpy stripe hype sweater. Let me get my act together here. Okay, so this is the stripe hype, same structure in the same way that this is coming together, the backs and the fronts, and then you combine it together to knit in the round. Now, when you do that, you are knitting a good portion of the yoke. Well, you're knitting the entire yoke of the sweater flat because you're knitting each of the different pieces separately. And then you're picking up stitches to combine everything together. Now, I don't know about you, but my flat knitting gauge where I'm knitting on one side and purling on the other side and what have you is a lot more open than my knitting in the round gauge where I'm just knitting and I'm not doing really any purling if it's especially a stockinette on every other round. And I didn't think about this a whole lot going into the project. I just kind of put faith in the process and maybe hoped for the best. I did a little bit of a gauge swatch, but I didn't gauge swatch flat and in the round, and that would have been my first mistake. I really should have gauge swatched with a, um, a swatch knit in the round, and then I should have done another one knit flat, compared the two swatches to determine what is it that I need to do once I've connected everything together and am then knitting the sweater in the round because my gauge is going to change. And it absolutely did. I started, um, I picked up stitches for the sleeves of this sweater. I started knitting the sleeves and I just noticed that the gauge was way more, I don't want to say tight, it was just much more together than the gauge of the rest of the sweater. And it dawned on me, like, almost like obvious, like, hello, of course it's going to be like that. You're knitting every single round. There's no purling involved. Everything is going to be much more consistent. And it absolutely was. And so it caused me to pump the brakes a little bit on this project and to really consider what I'm doing with this project because this is how they're both knit. And so it was, it's just one of those moments where I had to tink back the sleeve. I took the sleeve out here because I not even tink back. I just ripped out the sleeve because I knew I couldn't carry on like that. I needed to make some adjustments. I knit about, I want to say half of an inch 
of the body of the sweater after I connected it to knit in the round. I knit about a half an inch and then I had to think about what I was going to do moving forward because that was noticeably more, the gauge was more tight than it was on the other portions of the sweater. And so after thinking about it, not really knowing exactly what I should do, I just decided I'm going to go up a needle size now that I'm knitting everything in the round. And that's exactly what I did. And I wish I could give you more of an example. And maybe you can see it here because I didn't go back on that little portion that I knit with the original needle size. Um, I don't really know if you'll be able to see. I don't, I'm trying to keep from hitting my microphone. So right here. Yeah, you can a little bit. There's a little ridge right here and that ridge separates what's being knit on a larger needle from this little section right here that was knit on the original needle size and then everything up here was knit flat so we have knit flat gauge knit in the round gauge using the same needle that i knit with here and then up here knit in the round using one needle size up so there is a little strip of fabric running right here that's a little bit of a tighter gauge than everything else because that's what I had that caused me to realize I needed to do something because I can't maintain, I couldn't keep doing that or else there would be a very noticeable difference in the tension of the fabric moving forward once I started knitting just in the round. And especially because this is straight up stockinette where you're just knitting on one side and purling on the other side or just knitting, it's much more noticeable. I don't know... If that little strip of fabric where I knit with that smaller needle, I don't know if it's so noticeable that I really want to go back and take all this back out because I feel like once I block it, you won't even notice that. I don't know. I really, I really don't think that it'll be noticeable. I think that it'll kind of, everything will even itself out. But I definitely realized at that point that I need to go up a needle size once I combine the body together to be knit in the round. Um, just it was quite apparent after that. And I'm going to have to do it with this sweater as well. I was kind of thinking that maybe I wasn't going to have to do it with this one only because there's so much texture going on here. Meaning that even when I do combine everything to knit it in the round, I'm still going to be doing a considerable amount of purling. Um, however, I was checking the gauge with my ruler and I was noticing that the gauge is tighter on the areas that I knit with a smaller needle. And so I do need to go up a needle size here as well. So my rule of thumb, when I knit these patterns that are done contiguously, where you're picking up different sections to add, you know, add, like to essentially make it seamless to keep you from having to sew things together in the end, when I'm doing that and going from knitting something flat to knitting something in the round, I have to go up a needle size to accommodate that difference in tension. Let me know if this has happened to you, what your experience has been. I can't think of another reasonable approach to that. Someone mentioned to me that once they knit, um, what was it? I think it was that when they were knitting everything flat, they did this, the knitting side on the recommended needle and then when they flipped it over to the other side to purl, they used a smaller needle size to make up that difference. To me, I don't think that's something I would want to do. I don't think that's something I would, I would just as soon not knit sweaters like this than do that. So I'm hoping that by just knowing once I get done knitting the portions of the sweater that are flat, uh, knit one side, purl on the other side, then I, and, and I connect it together to be knit in the round, I just know that I have to go up a needle size to make up for the difference in tension. So that's kind of what's going on with these right now. I, um, and I'm okay with, I'm okay with the results I'm getting after having done that. I think that it's good. I think that it's going to make the difference. I was also talking to Logan of Logan Knits and he mentioned that he just pays attention to that when he's knitting flat. He just knows that when he's doing his purls, he needs to be a little bit more snug with those purls than he would typically be because he needs to make make the he needs to make up the difference in tension somewhere or another. So he just snugs everything up a little bit more when he's doing his pearls. And I have to think about that too. So I just, 
I wasn't even thinking about it when I started both of these projects. And it then it became obvious when I switched over to knitting everything in the round that I really needed to consider that. So that is a consideration I'm making. It, you know, whenever I film the podcast after, what is it? What, you, what time is it? After three o'clock? Yeah, it's 3.30 right now. It, I have this problem. We get the clouds that come in and, and it goes in and out. So it's kind of frustrating, but we make do. But that's, that's what's going on with these right now. So I'm making some progress on these after having it slow me down just a little bit where I needed to kind of evaluate what I was going to do moving further. So if you have yet to knit a sweater, kind of like sweater number 18 or the stripe hype sweater where you are doing that contiguous, um, you know, technique where you're knitting the back and the front and then you're picking up stitches to combine everything. Um, that's something to consider. Your gauge is going to be different when you're knitting flat than when you're knitting in the round and you are going to make accommodations or need to make accommodations when you transition from knitting things flat to knitting them in the round. Somebody had also mentioned to me that Julia Weisenberger, I believe, um, she's the designer behind Coco Knits, that she's kind of the one who, um, I don't know if she developed that whole technique of contiguous knitting where you do the back and then you do the shoulders and then you connect to the, for the front. And it's it's sort of like having a seamed garment without having to sew pieces together in the end. Somebody mentioned that she's kind of the pioneer of that. I don't know how true that is, but I bet in her um, design books that she has, she probably talks about you know, how to deal with that changing of tension. And I need to look a little bit further into that. Um, I have a Coco Knits book and I think I'm going to dive into that and find out what exactly is recommended because I know, well, you could take a gauge swatch of, of the, with the yarn flat and then do a, a gauge swatch in the round with that same yarn, figure out what needle is being used and then just go with that. I guess that's just the most sensible way to do it. And I didn't do that ahead of time, but I feel like just simply going up a needle size is what I need to do to make up for those tension differences. So that's, that's kind of where I'm at with that. And I'm loving the projects. I'm really, really loving my um, stripe hype. I think this is going to be so much fun when it's all finished. I have 10 million ends to weave in because for whatever reason, I was doing really well carrying the yarn up the side when I was knitting initially, but I am not good about carrying the yarn up the side when I'm knitting stripes. I just get, I forget. And then there's too much space between the colors. I can't very well pull the yarn up and it's just a whole thing. So I just end up cutting the yarn. So I have like 10 million ends. Look at this. It's like fringe. This is ridiculous. I have so many ends to weave in when I'm all done and it just looks so sloppy. It's not going to look sloppy when I'm done, but it looks sloppy now, but I'm really loving it. And, and I'm not too terribly concerned about that little section that's knit in a tighter tension. I think that's going to block out just fine. So yeah, loving that. Stripe hype, sweater number 18, knit contiguously. I needed to make accommodations for my tension changes, but I think it's gonna be fine. I think it's all gonna work out in the end. Okay, before I wrap up for the day, I wanted to mention that I am so excited about the last midweek ramble where I talked about following this seven step process that I kind of created for myself to develop my own personal knitting aesthetic and essentially create a mood board that represents my knitting style. I asked you at the end of that episode and definitely go back and watch it if you haven't watched it, but I gave you some homework and that homework was to create your own knitting aesthetic mood board. And when I did that, I was thinking to myself, like, it'll be great if a few people submit a mood board to me that I can share on the next midweek ramble to kind of inspire people because I feel like mood boards can be very inspiring. I had no idea that so many of you were going to be so pumped about that idea and that, you know, concept of following those seven steps to come up with your knitting aesthetic, whether you follow those steps or not. I have received, I kid you not, 78 mood boards since I published that video. And that's not even including those of you that are using the hashtag over on Instagram. I created a hashtag on Instagram that says it's WNH made me do it. It's just a hashtag where you can share anything that you've been inspired to do by things that I talk about here on the channel. But I introduced that hashtag by letting people know that they could use it 
to share their mood boards based on that last midweek ramble. And I am blown away. And actually it may be more at this point because I've received several more today and I haven't checked my emails yet. Um, but I am so excited that so many of you jumped on board. I feel like it's it's just very, very inspiring. So if you have submitted a mood board based on that video, thank you so much for participating. I will be creating my own mood board and sharing it on Wednesday's episode of the podcast, as well as as many of the other mood boards that I can fit into the video for time so that you can see the mood boards other people have been creating. I will also be documenting my process for coming up with that mood board by following my seven steps that I laid out in that previous video. And I will be sharing that in a four part video series over on Patreon. It's going to be one of the new series that is a Patreon exclusive and it will be uploaded to the Patreon page in addition to one content piece that will already be there come Friday when Patreon goes live. So I'm really excited about that. I'm really excited about creating my own mood board. I'm excited to see and share all of the mood boards that you guys have submitted. I think it is just so great. So thank you guys so much for being enthusiastic about that. It really means a ton. That is it for me today, folks. Thank you so much as always for taking the time to hang out with me. It's always a joy to be able to share my projects with you, both unfinished and finished and all the other little exciting things that I have going on over here at Wool Needles Hands. You guys make it go around and you make it happen and you mean more to me than you could possibly know. Thank you so much for being here. As always, if you took value from today's video, don't forget to give it a thumbs up. Definitely subscribe, click that bell icon, maybe consider dropping me a super thanks. Be ready to check out Patreon come Friday when that goes live. And until I see you on the next episode of the Midweek Ramble, which is coming on Wednesday, happy knitting, happy making, happy whatever it is that you're doing. Take care, be well, and I will see you soon. Bye.